Welcome to Boom, where we have biomechanics on our minds. Boom. 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 Are you ready for our trail half marathon coming up? I'm ready, but I'm not so sure about my calves. Running over those sticks and rocks has got them sore and achy. Ow. Well, I wonder actually how that might relate to your mus- muscle activity. I bet we could use the game-changing wireless sensors developed by our sponsor, Delsys, so they wouldn't interfere with my natural motion to find out. Hmm. Well, good point. And Delsys has done a lot of research and innovation to ensure they're collecting actual physiological data and not noise from movement artifacts and other contaminants, so they're super reliable sensors. Plus, onboard filtering helps to improve accuracy by mitigating against issues associated with collecting data and highly dynamic activities like trail running. And even other applications like sports performance analysis, clinical testing, and robotics. If you're listening and interested in seeing how these kind of advancements can empower your data collection in and out of the lab, go to delsys.com slash boom and enter to win one of their portable EMG solutions, the Trigno Lite. Today, we are so excited to be talking with Caroline Kreider. Caroline is the Women's Health Lead and Product Marketing Manager at Aura, a company that makes a smart ring device to track sleep, physical activity, and much more, as we'll be talking about. So thank you so much for being here with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Good morning. For our audience who might not be familiar with Aura, although I think uh, many people are, um, can you talk a little bit about the company and the vision um, and the product that that Aura offers? Yeah, definitely. For people who are actually looking at the video, it is this tiny little ring. It's about the size of a wedding band, and it happens to be a general wellness and health tracker. So a lot of people have heard of us before as a sleep tracker. Mm -hmm. That's where we first became famous. We were one of the first companies to really like found ourselves in sleep instead of activity tracking. Mm -hmm. But the ring also measures you know, your activity, your heart rate, your respiratory rate, temperature, a bunch of other metrics. Mm. Um, And we're a Finnish company. So based out of Finland for our headquarters, but now all over the US as well. And so people are buying us for a lot of different reasons to get better sleep, to track their activity, to kind of look at long term health patterns. So you may have heard of it also as the COVID ring, Um, we became really popular during COVID, not for being a ring that can detect COVID, but for being the tool that the NBA chose to kind of monitor themselves and decide who to test when the pandemic first broke out. So if you do a quick Google, um, that made a huge difference in the company's uh, future and growth in the past couple years. Wow, very cool. And now now rebranding from sleep to (laughs) wellness um, and more and more generally. Yeah, absolutely. You know, a lot of people buy the ring for sleep first because it unlocks something that they're interested in, Mm -hmm. better workouts, better productivity, better insert here. But then they end up using the ring for everything else because while you're looking at one pattern, you go, huh, what's up with my heart rate every time I do X, Y, Z? So it becomes a more general health Mm -hmm. tool. That's awesome. We're super excited to talk about the projects you're working on at Aura, but first we always like to kind of go back to people's beginnings and ask, when did you first know you wanted to be in the field of wearable health technology? Yeah, I really like that question because surprisingly, all the way back in college, um, so I um, was a political science and psychology major, which how does that relate to wearables? (laughs) I read a political science study that was about how people were using galvanic skin response, so the sweat gland activity on your hands, to measure how people respond to political advertisements. Hmm. And it was all about arousal and attention and what do consumers say versus what does their body show with Mm -hmm. their response to something. So my first wearable was a galvanic skin response machine that you tape onto your fingers and um, Carleton College is a really incredible place for nerds like me to just blossom. <laughs> and so I played with that tool, and it was my first introduction to, oh my gosh, you can read so many amazing things from the human body. And from there, there has been a long graveyard of devices in a box that I have <laughs> you know, tested and tried. Um, and I found that the ones that really resonate with me are tools that actually help people understand and improve their health. Mm-hmm. So when Aura opened up a US office, I applied to every single job they had open <laughs> with a cover letter saying, 
you know that you need me. So I've had a long passion for physiology, mm. but Aura is the first time um, that's come to life as a wearable company. Yeah, that's so awesome to hear. And I like your emphasis on not just sharing health data with people, but actually giving them insights to understand and make changes and really have some tangible tangible insights. Um, can you share a little bit more about that in terms of how, because I think this is like kind of a challenge, I think, in wearable technologies, but just digital technologies in general. It seems like we're collecting a ton of data. How how we make sense of it and then how we also share it with consumers. It probably is also influenced by your psychology background too. Um, but I'm curious in terms of this hurdle of like how, how to give really um, clear and understandable feedback to people. Um, do you have any, I guess, tips or like learnings that you've had from that? Yeah, I think it's been really helpful to actually be on the marketing side because a lot of what I do is interview consumers and say, what are you looking for? Mm. What do you actually, you know, why are you searching for something like a step counter, a sleep tracker, an activity counter? And what it's really come down to is that for a tool like Aura, it is a tool for answering questions that you have about your health. Mm. And so if you buy the device and you don't have a question, the data is overwhelming. Mm. You're not going to know what mm -hmm. to do with it. And you're going to be like, this magical thing isn't telling me mm -hmm. something magical to do. <laughs> but if you buy the device and you start looking at questions that you have, why do I wake up feeling groggy in the morning? Mm -hmm. why, why do I sometimes feel great on my long run on Thursday? And why do I sometimes just feel like absolutely like I am running through the mud? Mm -hmm. So I think the most helpful way to use it is to have this question about your health like, and I want to understand how caffeine impacts me. Mm -hmm. Or I just started this new birth control and I can't tell, you know, is this good for me? Is this better than the last thing that I was doing? Mm -hmm. Or I just bought blackout curtains and they were $300. Was that worth <laughs> it or not? Uh, and once you have one of those questions, you can look at the data. And even if you're not somebody who's used to looking at the data, you can start to see before and after things that are higher and lower and then ask yourself, how are you feeling and what is the data show? And do you want to make a change based on that? Like one of the things that we hear all the time is somebody's like, oh, I want to get better sleep. They buy it. They realize mm -hmm. banning their phone from the bedroom makes a huge difference mm -hmm. in the quality of their sleep, mm -hmm. but they don't actually want to give it up. But it has empowered them to understand what's impacting their sleep. And maybe they decide they'll be on their best behavior four nights a week, but three nights a week, they're going to have their phone in the bedroom. <laughs> so it's that type of like health journey yeah. leading to a behavior change. What I'm curious what like typical timelines look for people that you're, you know, talking with and sort of discovering their journeys like are and for looking at trends like. Do you encourage or discourage people to look over certain timelines for different things? For example, with sleep, like, are you looking nightly? Are you looking weekly? Are you looking for monthly patterns? Yeah, can you talk a little more about that? Yeah, that's huge. One of the best parts about Aura is it's really meant to be a long-term health tracking mm -hmm. tool. Mm -hmm. The first generation of wearables were like, Congratulations, do you need somebody to yell at you to get 10,000 steps every day? We are here for you. Yeah, many of them but for still something are. Like, it's, many of them still are. For, for Aura, we have this really beautiful feature that's called Trends, and it allows you to look at your data daily, but you can also look at it weekly, monthly, and yearly. And so it starts to enable you to look at your health data on the scale that change actually happens. Mm -hmm. And so if it's something like sleep, being on your best behavior for one night of sleep isn't the full picture of your health. Right. It's how is your sleep changing when you commit to it for a month? Mm -hmm. How is it changing when you get a new job? How is it changing when you go home for the holidays and you thought that the vacation was going to be restful, but oh, it turns out your parents are still as stressful as they were when you were a child. <laughs> And when you start to be able to look at those longer term patterns, that's really the scale that behavior change happens on. You know, if you're going to get in shape, for example, you can hit your 10,000 step goal every week, but your heart rate isn't going to come down for maybe months. Mm. And so you need to be looking at those patterns over longer term and where it can be really, really, really meaningful is we have long term health impacts. Maybe you start a new medication. Mm. Maybe you get an extreme illness like COVID. 
And now that we're able to see those long-term patterns, you can see that healing in the body doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people who actually need those long-term patterns to be able to celebrate the progress that they're actually making in their health. Yeah, that's such a good point. Because I can imagine with some of these changes, like birth control, for example, it's like you start taking this new hormone and then... I feel like immediately after starting, I'm like, okay, have has something changed? Like, how am I feeling? But it's, is it working? Yeah, so, <laughs> but then it's like not until, I guess, months later where you might actually start to see those effects. But by that time, I feel like I've forgotten that that might be the cause of why I'm Huge. feeling like that. And then all of these other things have been happening in the meantime. So sometimes it's hard to really um, just like on your own be able to look at, like understand those patterns, I guess. Um, so that's yeah, we have natural cues built into the app that obviously most people, you know, open the app every morning and check every day. But we also have weekly reports, mm-hmm. monthly reports, these seasonal and year in review reports. Mm-hmm. And that kind of cues people to reflect not just on the day, but the year, the season, the week, the month mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. kind of say, hey, maybe let's look at these patterns a little bit longer term yeah. and give ourselves a break. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious now. So, um in terms of the projects that are currently going on at Aura that you're really excited about, would you be able to share a little bit um, about those and, and what you're, you're currently doing? Yeah, there are a lot of different things going on at Aura. I think the ones that I can speak the most about um, are I'm really focusing on reproductive health in the past year. And so I think one of the interesting things with wearable companies is you normally see the science bubble up and then a little while later, you know, up to even a year, the feature actually show up in the Mm -hmm. app and get consumerized. And so the most exciting project that we've had in the past year or so has been launching our first FDA cleared um, project with the Natural Cycles brand. Mm -hmm. So now you can take the temperature data in the ring, which we had already seen in research, Mm -hmm. can help predict your menstrual cycle, certain events like ovulation or pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And now you can feed that temperature data from the ring into the Natural Cycles app, which is FDA cleared to be used as hormone-free birth control. Mm. And so it is one of the first like wearable birth controls to replace waking up every single morning and measuring your temperature with a manual thermometer every single day Mm -hmm. at the Mm -hmm. same time. And then remembering to then take that temperature and uh put it into an app or write it in some journal, which you're then trying to make sense of. All of that. (laughs) And so I think it's like the first wave of, hey, temperature. There's a lot here, Mm -hmm. and we're not really using it for much, and it doesn't have to be as painful as a thermometer that's next to your bed and kind of dominates your schedule. It could be as simple as going to sleep, wearing a ring, and then waking up with insights around your hormones and your cycle. Mm -hmm. So I hope that we continue to expand on that, um, and that that will be um, a lot of momentum at a cultural time when that matters a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm curious, like, I'm sure there were lots of challenges in getting, that's, well, one, congratulations, that's a huge accomplishment, I feel like. Um, Thank you. And really, you guys are pioneering, um, I feel like, in a space that people really have not been before, and just, I am always impressed with the science that comes out of Aura. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just curious, like, what were, what did it take to kind of get there? Like, um, and, and what do you think would be a big home run from this collaboration and this project? I mean, I think it's already been a home run. I'm very biased. It's my absolute passion project <laughs> at Aura. But I think I think what's really incredible, and I appreciate you, you, you saying that about the research coming out of Aura, is our science team is always tinkering, is always like deep in the data saying, what patterns are we looking at? So what's pretty incredible, and you guys will understand this, is you're on the academic side where there's a certain pace and cadence, Mm -hmm. and I'm on the consumer side (laughs) where we try to speed things up. But when you look at it, our first menstrual cycle research with the temperature data from the ring was more than five years ago. And so we only launched our first period prediction feature last year, and our first you know, fertility hormone style feature this year. And so I think a home run is almost any progress <laughs> because reproductive health and women's health research is, is consistently lagging behind, mm-hmm. but it's that thousand mile journey. Mm-hmm. If five years ago we knew we could see something, well, you gotta keep 
you know, slowly moving forward. So what I would love to see and what we're interested in looking at more is we know that we can see a lot of data around other events in the menstrual cycle Mm -hmm. and just deciding like, how do we bring those to life in the app and what do women really want? What are they looking for? Mm -hmm. Is going to be a journey that doesn't happen overnight. It may take five more years, 10 more years to get a full suite of features that are really helpful. But I hope that it's gaining traction and more women are starting to say to each other, hey, you know when we learned about our reproductive health cycle and they only taught us about our period? Couple details that they missed here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and starting to yeah. make that more popular. Um, yeah, it's, it's really incredible. And um, it's incredible that you've been able to unlock these features, like you said, five years ago. And then that sounds like a long time, but in like the scale of academia, as we talked about earlier, that's exactly. really so short. Um, you know, we're hopeful if any of our projects get to actual users in five years. So, um, yeah, it's really incredible. And I'd like uh, I'd like to dive a little deeper into sort of maybe some of the science behind the like tracking and using how you're using temperature and how that relates to cycle tracking and fertility yeah. and some of the things you've talked about. Can you just, for our users who, or some of our audience rather, who might not be as familiar, um, can you just talk a little bit about what that interplay looks like? Yeah, I think most people aren't familiar <laughs> yeah. because our, like our relationship with temperature is entirely based on normally a parental figure and a back of a hand Mm -hmm. and maybe a thermometer every now and then. So I will say, as much as I'm a crazy, passionate, um, vigilante for the reproductive health (laughs) elements of temperature, it's also incredible for early illness detection. Mm -hmm. And what we're learning over time is we measure skin temperature and measuring it from the fingers from the from this small ring that can really change temperature with your body is really key mm-hmm. but there's this whole world of when you grew up you were introduced to core temperature yes and core temperature your body wants to keep as constant as possible it's not good if your temperature is going crazy and your internal mm. organs are suddenly <clears throat> high or low yeah. so your body tries to maintain that core temperature as consistently as possible and to do that it uses your skin. So if you get too warm, you're, you're working out, you're heating up, that's why your body pushes that internal heat and you start flushing and sweating mm-hmm. to try and dump the internal heat into your skin. Mm-hmm. Same thing when you walk outside in the cold like Minnesota day, <laughs> your body goes, oh my gosh, our core temperature is dropping and it pulls all of the heat from your extremities mm-hmm. into your core. So one of the incredible things about measuring something like skin temperature is your core temperature might barely change according to your circadian rhythm throughout Mm -hmm. the day. Like we warm up in the morning, we cool down at night, Mm -hmm. but your skin temperature is going up and down by hour and minute. And all of these changes hold a lot of meaningful information. Mm -hmm. And so some of the work that we did is related to reproductive health. And you can start to see these patterns of estrogen cools you down at the beginning of your cycle then you ovulate and progesterone heats you up. So you can look at cold, hot patterns to see a menstrual cycle. Mm. Or when it comes to illness, all three of us would have a different temperature that we tend to be at. Mm -hmm. And when you start to do illness research, you can see that all three of us would bake a fever at a different temperature Mm -hmm. and it would look different. So as soon as those forehead scanny guns started coming out and everyone was like 100 degrees, that's our fever temperature. No, yeah. it turns out it's really personal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, 98 and 98.6 is not everyone's normal, right? <laughs> yeah. No, we all have those friends who are like, oh, I'm always running hot. Or that friend who is always cold. And it's like something that we've known intuitively, but now we have the data to back it up and to start to see this is what's normal for me. This is what's not normal for me. Yeah, and I think that's so empowering, too, because it's, I also think, like, sometimes when I go, because I feel like my body temperature tends to run really low, so when I'm in, like, the high, like, 99s, I'm like, okay, like, this is very, this is high for me, and then, but then I go to the doctor, and they're like, no, like, you don't have a fever. Uh, You're good. Yeah, and I'm like, oh, I feel, like, it just, I'm like, no, I I know myself, but I think having Mm -hmm. data um, to back that up also feels like, something that I mean obviously would need to be able to still have the healthcare system receptive to that um, but it just feels a little bit more um, quantitative and um, like it could just give some um, yeah just 
some standing, I think, to some grounds for um, how we're feeling and, yeah. and, yeah, what we're trying to share with our doctors and providers. You wake up with the question, like, am I okay this morning? Like, I, I don't feel well. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of confirm it in your data. Ooh, it does look like my body is trying to fight something. Mm -hmm. And then that, that gives you a little bit more information when you do call your care provider. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And this also reminds me, which I think you kind of started uh, touching on with the study that you did with UC, or that UC San Diego did using the Aura Ring. And they found um, elevated levels of distal body temperature after a median of five and a half days following self-reported conceptive sex in a feasibility study for early detection of pregnancy, which I think was about like nine or ten days earlier than um, individuals found out that they were pregnant through other means, like a pregnancy test or at the doctors. Um, and I thought that this was a really interesting study. I'm curious both in um, terms of UC, UC San Diego carrying out this study and mm -hmm. if there is like a collaboration that you work with or do they just like use the technology and or what is your sort of interplay with um, academia and research and in that type of setting. Um, but then also, yeah, just, uh, oh, go they ahead. Did a, oh, go ahead. Oh, no. Yeah, let's start there. That sounds good. <laughs> um, it's, it's a really great example of we're really careful with the partners that we choose to do research with mm -hmm. because something that's really important to us is participant-driven research. Mm -hmm. So you'll see with like our COVID research with UCSF and with this study with UCSD, the most important thing to us is if we're going to empower researchers to connect with our community in the app, we want them to be giving the results back even before the paper is officially mm. published mm. back to the group that's participating in the research. Mm -hmm. So the UCSD study is this awesome example where we actually sent a message in the Aura app saying, hey, has anyone been pregnant while you were wearing the Aura ring? Because we've heard from a lot of a lot of you from our like technical support tickets and mm -hmm. on social that you discovered you were pregnant wearing the ring. Can we work together with UCSD? Can you tell us about some patterns that you saw, your personal experience, how your birth went, like as many possible elements of sharing your experience mm. as possible. And then we'll see if we can see any patterns across it. So when UCSD looked at the data, it does seem like, well, when you have progesterone in your cycle, not drop off at the end, but get warm and stay warm, it seems like there's that sustained signal of that hormone that indicates that you're pregnant and you can see it in your temperature going up and staying up. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more work that needs to be done there, but it's an exciting example of if you have all of these people who are trying to answer questions or are spotting patterns in their data and you bring them together with a researcher who can actually at scale analyze it, well, you might start to see some exciting patterns. And so it takes a long time to consumerize that. And you have to be very careful about that. There's all these beautiful and important questions about, well, how early would you want to tell somebody that they might be pregnant? There are so many pregnancies that might not implant or that might be mm -hmm. unsuccessful. And are you actually going to cause a lot of psychological harm or stress or trauma by creating this early detection system? Versus like, how late do you want to let somebody know? And how do you build that feature and what needs to be regulated or not? So we're a big fan right now of like, here's the pattern. Many people have seen it in their data. Should you happen to see that pattern? Like that might empower you. It is not a formalized feature in any way, but maybe keep an eye out if that's something that's important to you because if other people can share their experience, and you spot something similar, I think we move a lot faster than the speed either of consumer features or of academic research. Yeah, and it because <clears throat> it's also, I think, not just giving people the information, mm -hmm. but then they can actually take action on that if they might want to limit their alcohol consumption or other things um, early, which have been shown to actually have an impact on um, risks and, and complications in, in pregnancy and birth. Um, it's awesome to be able to do that earlier and and give people those tools. Mm. And I love this, like creating it's this- It's huge. Oh, sorry. Mm. Yeah. I love that you're creating sort of this community, data-driven, mm -hmm. like empowering people to use their own data, but also empowering people with the insights you have from looking at not just their data, but lots of data. Um, and 
how people are sort of giving you feedback and you're doing this participant driven research. And I'm just curious, what does that sort of balance look like in um, empowering people and giving them um, yeah, this information and also having them share back their information. Like, what does that look like and what does privacy and concern and ethical mm -hmm. concerns sort of look like around that and how did you strategize there? Yeah, um, because Aura is based in Finland, we follow both European and US privacy mm -hmm. restrictions. So we take mm -hmm. data privacy really, really seriously. Mm -hmm. And the studies are conducted anonymously according to IRB rules so you know we're, we're very clear about separating mm -hmm. that so we want people to share as much information as possible mm -hmm. if they can because the more data that we have the more likely we are to discover a pattern mm -hmm. maybe we don't know what happens in the third trimester and it turns out there's a really interesting hrv change mm -hmm. that we'd like to mm -hmm. know about and if somebody only shares their data of possible conception we miss out on this hrv pattern that we might have seen totally. but it's definitely up to the comfort level of individuals and I think what we'll start to see more and more of and it's already getting out there is it's great to share something formal with a researcher because you know uh, the tools that exist and the the intellectual brain power just the horsepower in the academic community can lead to one type of discovery but it's almost more important that people are just sharing patterns more casually mm -hmm. because Discovery can happen a lot faster if we're all just talking about our health totally. on a more intimate you know, level. And even though you can share patterns with an academic, it might take a year to actually get that paper published and it might not come with behavioral changes. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're more interested in seeing is Laura Rings definitely empowered a lot of people to talk about their sleep with their partner, for example. Partners get the ring, oh. they both share their data with each other. It maybe empowers them to do something like, if I wake up with a lower readiness score than my partner, I ask him to do like more of the burden at home. Like, can you cook tonight? Can you go to the grocery store? Mm. And so that same thing with reproductive health, I think is really important. Empowering groups of women to say, mm hey, here's what my menstrual cycle looks like. What's yours looking like? Oh, when do you think you ovulate? Hey, I just figured out X, Y, Z and make these conversations that we have never had yeah. mm -hmm. suddenly part of the normal every day so that if you're going through a difficult fertility journey and maybe you just had an implantation event and it's four days until your next ultrasound to confirm if it worked or not, Maybe you've got two friends that are looking at your temperature data with you and going, I don't know, it looks high, it looks high, I'm feeling good about this. <laughs> and suddenly the emotional support that you're able to get or offer to one another comes with this body discovery and a lot more empowerment around your data. So I would like to see people sharing patterns and being almost letting like, yes, there's the privacy barrier that you have with a company or a researcher, but let it all go in your private groups mm -hmm. where you have your friends, where it's just like, talk about your vaginal discharge next to your data <laughs> with one another. Yeah. Like, let there be almost no constraints on what's possible between your, your trusted group of friends and family who know you best. Yeah, it's so true. And I, and I think something that I, I think about too is like mood and the, mm. and menstrual cycle and and how those interact together because because I also think there's some mm, it almost is like supportive in some ways when I'm like having like a couple days where I am just not feeling great and like and you know, Hannah knows my like fluctuations and I'm like well I know that this is going to yeah. be over in a couple days so I'm just going to do work that's more independent and I'm going to stay mm -hmm. at home and do more reading and like kind of change my schedule. I, I do have to change my schedule based on that but it'd be nice to like be able to sort of prepare for that and um, whereas I feel like I tend to like not realize it until it's already happening um, and then trying to figure out what to do um, but yeah and then also I think in terms of like intervening and then figuring out what is actually helpful because ideally that would be like the situation yeah. that we would or like where we would end up in, in the future. Um, but it's really nice. And learning about your cycle that way in the first place. <clears throat> yeah, like totally. It probably was not explained to you that your athletic performance, your mood, your productivity might change. Mm -hmm. It was like, listen, here's how you're gonna predict the days that you're bleeding. Might feel a little crampy. <laughs> it's like, there's actually so much else. Like yeah. so if, true. if women, you know, if, if somebody like you was able to be at my puberty's just around the corner class and say, hey, by the way, 
you might be able to change your schedule around when you're, you know, uh, planning around your cycle. And that could make all the difference. Like I'm doing a literature review by myself. I'm studying by yeah. myself and <laughs> I, I'm maximizing this time yeah. rather than making it sound like this suffer fest that you yeah. can't overcome. Yeah. Yeah. And also just a reminder too that, um, you know, I'm like, the world is not on fire. I mean, it might be on fire in some, like in some other senses, but I'm like, <laughs> in a few days, like I'll be able to like, you know, see mm-hmm. the, 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 better things again be a little bit more hopeful and I think that in itself is also helpful in like getting through those times too so I feel like there is just like so much to learn and I think it's it's really nice to I think see this emphasis on women's health too at Aura and sort of closing that that um, gap in knowledge I am about women's health yeah, I like I'm sorry for men, but their bodies aren't as exciting. <laughs> Ours are like these chemistry sets. You know, like there's just so much changing that the aura ring is amazing for my partner, but my data changes way more than his does and I'm like, "Whoa, there's like a lot to unlock here <laughs> that you just don't you, you just don't have if your hormone levels are a little bit more testosterone consistent." <laughs> I'm sure those are fun conversations. <laughs> well, look at my data. Oh, they are. <laughs> he's but be, he's become a but he's become a a big advocate. He's big in the cycling community out mm. here, and there have been times where he meets uh, a guy who's like, "Oh yeah, I got the aura ring with my partner, and her data really changes, uh, you know, a lot more than mine." He's like, "Have you heard about the menstrual cycle?" <laughs> And it's it's amazing because a lot of men aren't empowered to even discuss Mm, with their partner about how their menstrual cycle might impact them. And so Mm. suddenly if there becomes this tool, whether it's your sleep data, whether it's reproductive health and temperature data, if you're able to point to something and say, here's what's going on in my body right now, and maybe you have the words to explain it. Or maybe a number on a screen and a pattern helps you explain it. Either way, you're talking about it more. And that's a great thing. Yeah, I love the, there's like that funny historical example of NASA sending Sally Ride to space with like 100 tampons. 1,000 tampons? 1,000 tampons, yeah. And it wasn't even, it was for one week and she didn't have her period. (laughs) It's amazing. It's like, it's like the 1,000 tampons problem. It's like if that could become the new trolley problem. The new trolley problem is 1,000 tampon problem (laughs) and trying to figure out how to make (laughs) menstrual cycles more accessible. (laughs) Um, well, yeah, that, that's amazing. I'm curious just sort of overall if you could share um, a, any tips or surprising learnings that you've had. Um, I love that you said, like, how we could maybe change education for, you know, girls who are just discovering these things about their bodies. Um, but I'm just, yeah, yeah, I'm just wondering if there are any sort of top tips that you'd like to share, or top learnings um, with our audience. Yeah, I would say that... Um most people before they started at Aura, including myself, the words follicular and luteal would have been a hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, never heard of that, not familiar with it. And so I think one of the really fun tips that I have just related to reproductive health is within a friend group, go ahead and ask each other, do you know how your birth control works? If you're on birth control, or do you know what the different phases are of your cycle if you're not? And guaranteed, a huge percentage of people in that group will be like, no, I've got, I mean, I kind of have some idea. I maybe have some idea. And then start learning about that together. If you have any wearable, you can really start to see Mm -hmm. either how your medication impacts your body, or if you do have these two phases of your cycle, this kind of cool, hot, cool, hot, if your first relationship with your cycle is just going from, I'm at the time when I'm not bleeding and the time that I'm bleeding, just this two modal situation Mm -hmm. to now I have a follicular, now I have a luteal, and now I have a period. Mm -hmm. It really changes the conversation because you can start to see how you feel during your follicular phase, that first half of your cycle, and it might be on top of the world and strong and powerful and capable of achieving. How you feel during different parts of your luteal, where you might need to get crafty with Mm -hmm. maybe you're switching from cardio workouts to strength, Mm -hmm. I and mean, then how you're actually feeling during your period. And I think it just gives more nuance to your cycle. So if somebody can start there, mm-hmm. 
then, you know, down the line, if you want to see how you feel around ovulation, you know, cool. You could you can really start to hack your cycle, game your cycle and get to know it. But I think just moving beyond days that I'm bleeding and days that I'm not, which is how so much of uh, so many of us are taught about our cycle is really 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 empowering and nuanced. And it's better done with friends because it's a lot of information. Mm, a lot yeah. of us have never looked at it before. So I've found the like do you know how your birth control works? to be a really funny question <laughs> among groups of women yeah. because most of us don't. And then we started figuring out some women are on a single hormone that, you know, continues for the entire mm-hmm. thing. Some women, some of my friends were on triphasic pills and they were like, what does that mean? Oh, well, my body's trying to simulate a cycle with this, mm-hmm. you know, pill group. Mm-hmm. Some people are on non-hormonal IUDs versus hormonal. And so as soon as you start to have those conversations, you can go back to your medical professional with a couple more questions about, <laughs> yeah. hey, why am I on this versus that? And so that my top tip would just be to start talking about it um, because there's a lot to learn and it's it's more fun to do it with the other people who are equally as confused as you are and <laughs> yeah. kind of gain that knowledge together in a safe space. Yeah, exactly. I remember one time listening to a podcast where someone referred to birth control as the largest uncontrolled scientific experiment in human history and that just like really put it all into perspective mm-hmm. for me um, but I really like your point of talking about it with friends and family too because I also feel like that feels like more of a safe place to start mm-hmm. talking about it understanding and um and I think it's nice with technology like aura and um and the reports that you're giving to people to also kind of like take off that heavy burden of trying to track things and predict things and it's nice that you're able to Mm -hmm. sort of do that (laughs) difficult part to people and like understanding the data and translating it in a way that is understandable and actionable Mm -hmm. um and I also really like to kind of go back to one of your earlier points I think um we're at the stage now where we're collecting so much data and a lot of passive data and just having so much that it's I think from just the scientific or technical part where you're just like looking at all this data, it can be really hard to understand what the heck to do. Um, But I really liked your point too. And like that you talk to people, you understand what questions that they have and how you can really serve people with the data that you're getting and and how to interpret that. So I just wanted to, uh, before we sort of transition to our final questions, just like highlight that point, because I think that was a big um, learning for me. It's so relatable, like uh, an experience that I hear about all the time from women that's very vulnerable is many women in their college years where they start to be sexually active had that moment where their period did not come according to the calendar Mm -hmm. method. Mm -hmm. And they went, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, my period's late. And there's the pregnancy test. There's the isolation. Mm -hmm. Just this moment of pure panic. Mm -hmm. But if you are actually empowered to understand your cycle... And you could see, oh, my period, it's not even, it's not coming. It actually <laughs> delayed and I can see that in my temperature pattern. Yeah. Yeah. If, mm-hmm. if we could remove that stressful life event that is so mm-hmm. common for so many mm-hmm. women and instead teach you about your cycle and have you be like, it's exam time. And I can already see in my temperature data that it's <laughs> delayed. And so I am not worried Yeah, I have a backup pregnancy test if I need it, but I am already so aware of my body and my Mm. cycle that this isn't a surprise to me. It's like our bodies do not need to come as this aggressive, upsetting surprise to us (laughs) when it is understandable. So that's that's an example of an event and an emotion that so many women can identify with Mm -hmm. that like we could eliminate that in the next five years. Yeah. Mm. I love you've talked about so many tools, but like language being such an important tool to remember that we have and like equip people with, because once you can talk about it, once you have the words to talk about it, once you have the knowledge to talk about it, it changes everything, um, including that awareness piece. So yeah, I just kudos to all of that. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I mean, we have to use it more again. I I, I would love to say I did not know follicular and luteal Mm -hmm. And I taught sex ed through Planned Parenthood in high school, but this was never something that even, Mm -hmm. you know, came came up. And so it's kind of like, we're all sort of operating at the middle school, maybe (laughs) understanding. And I feel like if college, if college spent less time having the female orgasm 
come and talk to us about how to optimize and maybe more time just like getting me to a college or AP level understanding of my menstrual cycle. <laughs> that's that would be yeah. really actionable and I would use yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we'll hope for that in the future. <laughs> I think we're on our way. Um, but uh, yeah, I can't believe we would love to talk to you forever, Caroline. This has been so amazing. Um, but we're coming up on our last couple of questions here. Um, this one is um, one we like to ask all of our guests. Um, and that's, can you tell us about a time when you felt like you failed and what you learned from it? Mm. Yeah, being in a, a marketing role is really interesting because you get instant feedback on your successes or your failures, <laughs> <laughs> which for somebody like me who was a type A student, I love being graded and I love getting the feedback, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. a time that I failed recently was I, I failed up in that I learned a lot from this experience, but mm -hmm. when we launched mm -hmm. this Gen 3 ring, which is the most recent Aura model, we were launching it with our new period prediction feature. And that was the first like formal women's health, reproductive health feature. And I was so excited about that. And the team was so excited that we made this ad for the Gen 3 ring that put period prediction up at the forefront. And then when I looked at the data, we were just hemorrhaging our male audience. As soon as they heard about period prediction, they were gone. Whoa. They thought the ring was for women. Mm. They weren't interested anymore. And Whoa. so right at the beginning, I thought this ad was going to perform really well and be really engaging. And the numbers were just absolutely diving. And so one of the wow. really interesting marketing challenges is if you're a reproductive health brand, you can like lean into the period power, lean into all of the messaging. But if you are a brand that needs to appeal to male and female users, there's a mm -hmm. balance to be struck. And there's some mm -hmm. strategy of like, when do you bring in the mention of the P word or the mention of some of these topics <laughs> that may that may alienate a, a male audience? Because mm. it's important to remember we're not there yet. We're not mm -hmm. there yet mm. culturally where male audience members are like, oh, the ring prediction period. Hey, you know, partner, come in here. Sister, come in here. Like, <laughs> and so that's yeah. that's a time where the data was really damning. And yeah. even though it was a failure, it was, it was a learning and it's something that we're still, mm -hmm. we're still figuring out in situations where you can't target, how do you mention reproductive health in a way that's empowering to everyone? Yeah. It kind of reminds me, I think in some ways of, um, like, I guess I could see at Aura where you do become really comfortable with that and everyone's really excited about it and it's easy to talk about. And then like, it, you sometimes you forget that then you like step out of there and you're like, wait, and it kind of just reminds me of like research where we're like yeah. in our lab and like, we can talk about all these things. Yes. And then we like try to talk about it with, you know, present it in the same way somewhere else. And they're like, <laughs> like why? what are those words you're using? Absolutely. <laughs> so <it's> just, <laughs> yeah. That's um, how my, my partner feels is he's like, I can't take you anywhere. I, we go to a holiday party and you're like talking to the women in my office about their menstrual cycles within 30 minutes. <laughs> and it's like, at some point, we need some forum to get some of this out of our system. Yeah, you're like, well, someone's got to do yeah. it. Exactly. Why not at the holiday party? <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> when better than when you have a drink in your hand? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's funny. Well, before we ask our final question, um, how can people follow you and the work at Aura? Like, what is the best way to learn about some of the awesome new um, uh, technologies or studies that Aura is doing um, or, yeah, your work in particular? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, LinkedIn is the new social platform. It feels like we're all supposed <laughs> yeah. to be posting more. So I do try to post <laughs> updates on there. But to be honest, um, the best way to keep track of the research side is we have a really mm -hmm. great blog and our blog is called The Pulse. And there's literally a section that you can click on that says mm. research. And so browsing those archives, everything's curated there. So if you're just interested in the research side, that's the best place to go. But mm -hmm. the team that runs our social account on Instagram and TikTok and Twitter, they're really incredible and they're always tossing out information. So I would say actually following one of those accounts is a great way to not only hear about research, 
but also get some of the interesting insights. Mm. Um, sometimes, you know, it's a it's a highlight of a member and, and what they're doing in our community. And other times it's like, hey, did you know there's melatonin in breast milk? And so <laughs> there's a huge mix. And if you're already on one of those channels, it, it's really easy to just like follow us on Instagram or TikTok. That's awesome. Um, yeah, and I've read some of the blog posts, some of the blog posts you've written, Caroline, and uh, they're incredible. Great mix of sort of making it understandable, but also bringing in some really awesome and trusted science. So um, yeah, even if you don't have an aura, you should be able to still like look at some of the articles and you know, kind of suss something out that you might not have known. Like one of our core articles is how your menstrual cycle impacts your entire body. That feels like it mm-hmm. should be required sex ed reading of like, oh, yeah. I totally. Yeah. X, Y, Z. <laughs> so if people start with one article, um, that that would be the one. Okay, thanks. That's helpful. We'll put that one in the episode description. Um, awesome. All right. So our unfortunately, we're at our final question. Um, but looking to the future, what are you most excited about for the future of women's health, wearable technology? Mm. You pick. Ooh, I would say what I'm most excited about is a lot of different platforms are starting to come out that are kind of like their own social communities related to different topics. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. if you've seen the the brand, The Lowdown, um, they were starting to crowdsource like, hey, what are the side effects that everybody's seeing with different forms of birth control? What if we all talk to each other mm-hmm. about it? So I think mm-hmm. starting to see that and starting to see some features get built into multiple different apps where you can share your data with one another. That's what I'm really excited about is I think in our parents' generation, talking about problems with your health was not encouraged. You know, just think about how many of us Mm. have never heard about our mother's journey through menopause, even though it can be eight years. And so I would love to see our Mm. generation going into some of those more difficult life phases like man, I got to figure out fertility, pregnancy, menopause with more community and more Mm -hmm. resources naturally online and spaces that you can go to. So I would say some of it's happening really formally um, in apps and in these tools. And some of it's informal in forums like Reddit or Facebook, like a really great example Mm -hmm. would be due date groups. There are a lot of due date groups that form for women who are pregnant who have the same due date. So that they can share their experience as they hit each phase together. And so when you think about that type of community versus what our parents had access to, Mm -hmm. man, that is so huge. You you don't have to be isolated. You can go through that health journey with somebody in a similar life phase. So we're seeing Mm -hmm. that pop up more, but I hope a couple brands really lean into it and make some really great tools so that you can be texting your community at every life phase and getting responses and answers and support. Mm. Yeah, that's so awesome to hear. And I think the way that um, it's nice to hear how Aura is supporting that. And I think giving us the data that almost makes it easier to have some of those conversations too. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to see those working together. It's awesome to hear your vision for the future and what you're excited about. And yeah, we are just really, I know I really enjoyed this conversation. So we really appreciate you being so open to to talk about I think we brought a lot of new words onto the podcast today <laughs> that we haven't. <laughs> yeah, I don't think the P word has ever been on here <laughs> good that's that's where it's like I I think um you know I said at some point you know we got to do some sort of campaign that's like ask a friend about a follicle like all of us should be able <laughs> to use these words we need t-shirts like we need a t-shirt yeah. like everyone needs to be walking around in public being like Ask me about these five things because I would love yeah. to talk about them. <laughs> well, we'll put, when we have our t-shirt shop, so we'll oh, work yeah. together. Well, we you know, we'll partner that. on something <laughs> like this. And we're in. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thanks, Caroline. Bye, Bye mechanics, mechanics off our minds. minds.